Hello everybody, this is uh, Dr. Young, and I get a lot of questions about tautomerization and what does it mean and when do I need to worry about it and what are we talking about when we say tautomers. So I want to make this short video just to kind of discuss the concept briefly and show you a couple examples where you might have to worry about tautomerization. So tautomerization, I usually describe it as a, it, it describes the equilibrium between like the enol form and the aldo-keto form of a molecule. And so you may have heard this term enol before. It, it, it's, it's just comprised of the two words, en for alkene and ol for alcohol. This is where you have an alkene with an alcohol on it, right? So it's very specifically an alkene with an alcohol. And it's not like on the same molecule, it's on the alkene itself, right? So you're gonna have a, an OH group attached to a C double bond C. And then, so it's an equilibrium between this enol form thing and the aldo-keto form of something. And by aldo and keto, I of course just mean like, are we talking about the aldehyde or the ketone? Either one, it's gonna be one of these, these carbonyls. And really it could be an ester or an amide or something like that too, although they're not as prevalent generally speaking, but we usually refer like the, or the carbonyl, you could just call it the carbonyl form of a molecule. Now the big punchline here is that Enols are not, are generally not very stable. So enols, and I'll put generally, so enols, generally speaking, are not stable. They automatically turn into their carbonyl form, that aldo or keto form. You know, about like, 90 something percent of all of them that you're gonna see, not stable. And so why are they not stable? What's going on here? So let's just take a look at an example. Let's say we have this enol. Right, now if I look at this enol, just inherent in the enol itself, right? So let me label this enol, right? Here's an example of an enol. And if I look at the enol in and of itself, it has a resonance structure, right? I can have these electrons drop down and these electrons kick out to give me this resonance contributor. Where now there's a double bond O, there's an H, there's a positive now on that oxygen, and there's a negative now on that carbon. Right, so this is the enol, this, this, this is the enol. Maybe I'll even write this enol more in the middle, right? These are the resonance contributors for this enol. But if you look at its resonance contributor, right, this minor contributor on the left here, right, so I've got my major, I've got my minor. If I look at the resonance contributor here, the minor one, um, I've got a negative carbon, right, which we know is not super stable. Normally when we see negative carbons, uh, we should be thinking like really strong bases, right, so like um, alkyl lithiums or Grignard reagents or something like that, like a negative carbon is very, very basic, really, really wants an H. And if you look at um, the O being positive, it's got a hydrogen sticking off of it. Normally O positive, that's, that's not very stable either, right? That oxygen is really electronegative. It wants to take electrons back from something. And so oxygens on positive, sorry, hydrogens on positive oxygens tend to be really acidic. And so I always imagine it as um, what's kind of happening here. It, it's kind of like this carbon, this basic carbon, right? So this is basic, I'll make a little note, that's a basic carbon, that's an acidic hydrogen, that what happens is that the carbon is just going to sort of take that hydrogen and do an acid-base reaction within itself. And this is what's describing our tautomerization. This is tautomerization. Right, the enol is sort of spontaneously just going to move that hydrogen around here. Right, so now I still have the same backbone. I still have this five carbon backbone. But now the oxygen got the lone pair back, so it's not positive anymore. And this carbon down here picked up that H. And I'll draw in the H here just to emphasize that it got moved there. But again, really, I don't, I don't need to draw it there, right? We don't draw CHs typically. But it went from having one hydrogen here, right, over, I'll draw this over at the major, right, it only had one hydrogen there to begin with, and now it has two hydrogens here afterwards, right, so you move that hydrogen from the alcohol to um, that alpha spot, 
And I'm just going to redraw this because I don't like drawing things just out. Just hydrogens like that, right? It, it reverted back to like what we said. In this case, this is the keto form. Right, and so like I said above, tautomerization describes the equilibrium that exists between the aldo and the keto form. Right, so on the left in the blue there, I have the, al the, the enol. And you'll notice that my equilibrium arrows, I tried to make them lopsided so that it's more on the side of the ketone than it is on the side of the enol. The idea here is that enols, most enols, are relatively unstable and they automatically turn into the more stable um, carbonyl form, in this case, a ketone. And so its tomorization just describes that. Now there's another um, term that you should probably know, right? So this, this process is called tautomerization. And these two molecules, so if you look at um, that molecule and that molecule, these are a type of isomer, right? Because they have the same uh, formulas, but things are just arranged in a different way. They have a special name, which is tautomers. So these would be tautomers. They are isomers, but specifically, they're called tautomers. Tautomers. So you could describe them that way too, right? Tautomers obviously is just the term used for isomers whose relationship is through a tautomerization. Now, I said that almost always the enol is the unstable one and the keto form is the more stable one. So you should pretty much always turn your enol into the ketone or the aldehyde. Always, always just turn it back to the carbonyl. There are some exceptions though. Let me show you those. So some exceptions. Um, it's basically going to be when the enol um, allows for um, increased conjugation. And so what do I mean by that? So like here's, here's an example, which probably a lot of you have seen before. Um, let's say we have a, a really well-established right, molecule that you've already, you've already seen probably, which is phenol. Technically, if you look at phenol, it has an enol in it, right? Here's like the enol. But if you imagined it going back to the keto form, right? So if, this, if I tautomerize this back to the keto form, it would look like this. Right, that would be the keto form if I took that enol and I tautomerized it. Now, the big problem here, right, the reason why this is why I switched my equilibrium arrows, right, this is less stable, less stable. Sorry, let me get the right tool here. This is less stable, right, because you lose aromaticity. Right, this compound's no longer aromatic. You've lost all that conjugation. You've lost that extra stability that aromatic compounds have. So this would be an example where the enol form is actually the predominant one, not the keto form. Another example might be if you have um, if you have some really really long conjugated systems. So there's things like uh, curcumin, or um, or is a good example where you have a really long conjugated system where there's just Double bond, double bond, double bond, really conjugated, really long. Um, but the idea here, and actually let me tweak this slightly. You know, you have a really conjugated system like this, but in order to keep everything sp2 hybridized, this enol here needs to stay like this. Right, because if you imagine the resonance structure where it goes back to being the ketone, then you're gonna lose that long conjugated system, right? You're gonna break that that conjugation. So right, if you had, let me keep see if I can keep track of all of this. Right, so if you tautomerize it back here, then you've broken the conjugation. Right, so again, the enol form in this case would be more stable. So again, this is less stable less stable because there's less conjugation.
conjugation is the idea. So there are some examples where tautomerization doesn't always go from the enol to the carbonyl. These are two examples. They're really the only two I can think off the top of my head of where you don't see that. So this is the exception. This is like the 5% of the time, probably less realistically, where you're going to see enols not fully tautomerized back to their carbonyls. So let's take a look at some examples where um, we do reliably and we should tautomerize from the enol to the keto. So hydrations of alkynes, that's a common one. That's the first time people most usually see these tautomerizations, right? So you might remember if you um, did some reaction of an alkyne. Um, let me draw that better. All right, so let's say we have some sort of alkyne here, and we're going to do something like um, a hydroboration on it. So BH3, step two, we'll add water, sodium hydroxide, and peroxide. Right, normally we said this did the anti Markovnikov addition of water, right? So I would expect to get from this um, an ONH, right? Here's the H that was added to it, and here's the other H. I'll just draw that one out. But you added an O and an H in a Markovnikov fashion. And instead of stopping here, the idea is that we need to we, we need to be pretty savvy and we need to be like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got an enol. And so now I have to tautomerize this so that I draw no longer the enol, but I've turned it back into the carbonyl. I have to turn it back into that aldo form or that keto form, depending on wherever it is. So wherever that OH was, that's where the carbonyl is going to be, right? So I'll label this carbons 1, 2, 3, and 4, right? That's my 1, 2, 3, and 4 on the original molecule. So to to, to, in order to tautomerize it, or to tautomerize it, it's quite the, uh, quite the word, then all I'm going to do is, at that carbon 1, turn that back into the carbonyl. Right, so there's my carbon 1, 2, 3, and 4. And so I did do the tautomerization. Right here it was. And in this case, I turned it into not the keto form, but this would be the aldo form. Right, because in this case, it's an aldehyde. It doesn't matter, again, like I was saying before, if it's an aldehyde or ketone, it's the carbonyl form. You, you want to turn your enol back to the carbonyl. That's the idea. So you just got to watch out for these enols. Don't let an enol be the last product that you predict or that you propose. It's going to tautomerize. Same thing with our conjugate additions to alpha beta unsaturated systems, right? So, like, let's say we have um, an example here. where we have, um, let's just go with this friend, mm -hmm. and I'm going to add something like a, a small amine. And this amine here, I will add an acid catalyst. So if I'm drawing this first step, um, first step like always, right, protonate the carbonyl. We're going to have equilibrium set up here with the protonated carbonyl. And protonating in this case, right, just helps make the carbonyl more electrophilic so that subsequent reactions happen faster. Now we're going to have our amine attack this really electrophilic spot, but it do, it's one of those um, bases that does the, or it's one of the nucleophiles that does the conjugate additions. So I'm attacking that beta carbon. And if you haven't seen this type of reaction before, then you can kind of ignore what I'm saying until the very last steps, but... This is your, an example of a, of a conjugate addition. <clears throat> or now we've added the amine. It's an alcohol now up there, double bond move there. The amine is right here. In theory, the last step of this would be just that you lose your H to regenerate your acid catalyst, right? We added an acid catalyst there at the beginning. And I got to redraw this whole honker. And now my molecule is nice and neutral, plus I've remade my acid catalyst here. Let me redraw. It's looking a little bizarre. And then plus H plus. But again, right, the reason I'm doing this example is because it's tempting often for students to be like, okay, cool, I'm done. 
I'm just going to stop here. But again, you got to keep in mind that this is an enol. And so you have to tautomerize, you have to tautomerize it back into, in this case, the keto form. And so your final product really needs to be where you have the carbonyl back at that spot, right? I just put out the same carbon and everything else stays the same. So I went from the enol form to, again, in this case, the keto form. So that last drawing, that should be my proposed structure. That's the thing that I'm getting. So that's kind of where you might see these. That's a kind of review on tautomerization. It, it's going to pop up occasionally, um, but it just describes the equilibrium between an enol and then uh, the carbonyl. So I hope that was helpful. You'll um, do some practice. Let me know if you have any questions. Good luck.